Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In today's video, we are previewing the upcoming 2020-2021 season for the Charlotte Hornets. If you want me to make a season preview video for one specific team, let me know in the comments section down below, and that will increase the chance that I come out with that video for your team sooner rather than later. Before I get too far into this preview for the Hornets, though, I want to remind you all to leave a like and subscribe. I've been enjoying all the support that I've been receiving lately, and I hope to see that continue. Without further ado, let's get into some Hornets talk. Before we can really start to preview the upcoming season for this team, though, I would like to reflect upon and discuss the transactions that this team made in the recently concluded offseason. It started with them drafting LaMelo Ball with the third overall pick. Ball was a clear number one on my big board. He was the only player that I had in Tier 1 for this past draft. So I think that this was an absolute steal for the Hornets. I think that they were one of the biggest winners of the draft because they were able to draft LaMelo and so I love that pick for them. More on LaMelo a bit later. With the 32nd pick, they drafted Vernon Carey, who is a bit of a dinosaur. I didn't love that pick. I think that there were better options that they could have gone with here. But overall, he fit a position of need for them. And you certainly have to understand that when considering this selection. With the 42nd pick, they took Nick Richards, another big man who... Quite honestly, I didn't think was going to get drafted. But once again, fits a position of need. Must be a player that they see some upside in in the future in order for them for him to warrant them selecting him in the second round. Finally, with the 52nd pick, we have my favorite of the three second round picks for the Hornets, and that is Grant Riller. He's on a two-way contract for next year, but I think that he has a chance to, at some point in his NBA career, be a real light up the scoreboard type player, either coming off the bench or as a fifth starter type player. He's really, really good at scoring the ball at all three levels. He shoots the ball well from three, he can score at the basket, uh, and he also has a decent floater and mid range game that allows him to really be a threat to score from any place on the court. The problem with him is that he's not a very good playmaker. He's not a very good defender, and he has some injury history. But just because of that scoring ability, I think that he probably should have gone somewhere in the late 30s or early 40s. Some people even had a first-round grade on him. I wasn't quite that high on him. I think he was 37th on my big board. But I still think that it was absolute steal for them to get him at 52. And if he can overcome that injury issue, those injury issues, I think that they may have found a really solid backup guard for the future really late in the second round. Moving into free agency, the big move that this Hornets team made was signing Gordon Hayward to a four-year, $120 million deal. Uh, Hayward is probably not worth that in a bubble, but... When you take into consideration outside factors, such as the fact that they're the Charlotte Hornets, and um, this was really one of the only off-seasons where they won't have competition to sign high-level free agents like Hayward, and the fact that he was an all-star not too long ago makes me okay with the signing and almost condone it and be a fan of it for the Hornets. Finally, they signed Bismack Biombo to a one-year minimum. Uh, yeah, I don't have too much to say about that. <laughs> so now that we have uh, reflected upon the recent uh, moves for the Hornets in the off season, I think we're ready to preview the coming season for this team. As usual, we will start at the point guard position. And at the point guard position, we have LaMelo Ball. Like I said before, Ball was my clear number one prospect in this past draft, and I think that there is pretty good reason for that. He has a chance to be a generational talent in the playmaking category. He passes like no one else uh, in this draft for certain, and pretty much very few players in the NBA can. I would categorize him with guys like LeBron James, Luka Doncic, and Nikola Jokic in terms of his court vision and playmaking capabilities. I also think that at some point in his career, he's going to be an above-average three-point shooter. I get that the percentages look really bad, but when you actually get into some game tape and watch him 
Uh, he was mostly just taking bad shots, and he was actually able to hit those bad shots at a pretty okay level. He also shot the ball much better uh, towards the conclusion of the season uh, for the Illawar Hawks. And I think that that is probably a better reflection of how good of a shooter he is overall. I also think that at some point he's going to be a plus defensive player at the point of attack. And using his uh, plus height and plus length at the point guard position to guard guys at a high level is going to be a valuable asset. So I think that if LaMelo Ball really hits his ceiling of being one of the best point guards in the NBA because of his playmaking skills then clearly you can see that the Hornets came away with one of the steals of the draft there. I think he's going to fit into this team well. In the backcourt, they have a bunch of small guards that aren't terrific defensively and are pretty good floor spacers and three-point shooters. Ball is going to be able to cover up for some of those defensive weaknesses by taking on matchups against bigger perimeter players due to his Height and length, he does need to put on some weight in order to be able to truly guard uh, some of the bigger guards and uh, wings in the NBA. But if he can do that, I think he can be a really high-level defensive player. And he'll also be able to create open looks for those shooters such as Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham, Caleb Martin, Gordon Hayward, the newly acquired, even P.J. Washington. Like He's going to be able to generate good looks for those guys. And... I genuinely think that he is going to uh, be a really key piece for this team to build around moving forward. There's two more point guards to talk about here, and I think that they're both starter level guys in the NBA. So it's kind of a shame that there's so much positional overlap here. But overall, I think that there's a chance that the pieces really fit together well once we get into practice and see how this really works out. Uh, but the next guy is Devontae Graham. In my opinion, Graham should come off the bench for this team. I think that he would be in conversations for the sixth man of the year. When he's on the court without LaMelo Ball, he'd be able to run the offense at a very high level, create shots for his teammates. Uh, he can also shoot the, the three ball off of um, pull-up looks at a very high level, shoots it at the same, or just behind guys like Damian Lillard, Trey Young, He's terrific in the pull-up game, and that makes him very effective in the pick-and-roll. He's also a terrific playmaker, and that also allows for him to be great in the pick-and-roll as well as off of uh, secondary penetration opportunities where he can kick and find teammates for open looks. I think that if he's running second unit, it's going to be a very productive second unit offensively, and I'd rather see him running that second unit due to his plus playmaking skills that Terry Rozier does not have so much. Terry Rozier is the next guy I'm going to talk about, so we'll get into him now, but he's just the same level of shooter as Devontae Graham, and maybe even a bit of a better shooter off the catch and shoot. I think he shot it at like 45% off catch and shoot opportunities. So I'd like to see him start at the two guard alongside LaMelo Ball and Ball can create wide open three point opportunities for him and we will only see that three point percentage continue to go up for Terry Rozier. He's a legitimate sharpshooter and that is super duper valuable to a team. Obviously the defensive questions aren't great and when he's paired in a backcourt with someone who's currently not great on the defensive end like LaMelo Ball, it draws into question how effective they can really be as a pairing. But on the offensive end, I think that they would be lethal. So I think that that's the combination I'd like to trot out with Graham coming off the bench and running the offense for the second team. Alternatively, you could do the same thing with LaMelo coming off the bench and Devontae Graham starting. I just think that there's a really low chance of LaMelo not starting considering he was the third overall pick and uh, probably the biggest name that the Hornets have drafted in years, so they're going to want to get him inserted into the starting lineup immediately. So if I were the coach of the Hornets, if I were James Borrego, who I believe is a really high-quality coach, I would be trotting out LaMelo Ball and Terry Rozier as my starting backcourt with Devontae Graham coming off the bench. I also wouldn't shy away from playing all three of those guys 30 plus minutes per night. I get it won't create too many minutes for the other guards on this team like uh, Malik Monk, like uh, the Martin Twins, although I think that they can play some forward. 
but I just think that they're all really good players and I'm excited to see what they can do in this upcoming season. Moving on to the wing position, you have to start with Gordon Hayward. Like I said before, Hayward might be getting overpaid a little bit, but I think that he's going to have a really nice season in Charlotte if he can stay healthy. I think that there's a pretty good chance that he'll be an all-star this year. When I come out with my predictions for the upcoming season, I will be listing Gordon Hayward on my Eastern Conference all-star team just because I view him as a player who can really score the ball. He's going to be the primary option uh, in this Hornets offense, probably. I think that he'll be the first option over LaMelo Ball. So yeah, uh, and he's a very good scorer, can score at all three levels, pretty good in the mid-range game, shoots the three ball at a high level in the 37 to 40% range, and is a pretty good finisher at the rim. He's never been a superb athlete, and his recent injury history has only drained that athleticism, but he can still make uh, athletic plays at times. He's a good passer for a forward. On the defensive end of the floor, he's pretty much league average. He's certainly not bad because he has high defensive and basketball IQ overall, and that allows him to make good rotations off of the ball and on the ball. He's an active defender who doesn't get beat frequently, but he's not exactly a defensive playmaker, so I wouldn't rate him as an above average defender, but he certainly does his job. Overall, I think that this is a solid get for the Hornets. He's going to be their best player moving forward, and I think that he's only going to add to the amount of offensive skill on this team and continue to make them one of the more fun teams to watch play in the entirety of the NBA. Uh, the next wing to talk about here is P.J. Washington. I'm a pretty big P.J. Washington fan. I would say that I'm probably a bigger P.J. Washington fan than most. I think that he shoots the ball at a very high level, and that is super valuable from a wing player. He's at least average on the defensive end of the floor, and that was in his rookie season only. So I think that we could, could see him uh, continue to grow and become a really high-level team defender. He's not super athletic, and that limits how effective he can really be as an on-the-ball defender. But I think that he does a great job off the ball. And I also don't really think that the defense is all that important because on the offensive end, I really genuinely, genuinely believe that in addition to being a really good three-point shooter, he's going to develop an ability to attack closeouts, create looks for his teammates. I think he's already a pretty solid passer. I'm a big P.J. Washington fan. I don't necessarily think he'll make an all-star team someday, but I think that he's going to be a high-level starter at the four position in the NBA for a pretty long time. The next guy is Miles Bridges, who's maybe the only member of this Hornets core that I'm not as high on as the general consensus. I get that he's a freakish athlete, but it hasn't quite translated to the NBA on the defensive side of the floor. He's not afraid to take on more challenging defensive matchups but he hasn't done a terrific job in those matchups quite yet. We've seen him actually struggle quite a bit on the ball. But off of the ball, he has capability to really create havoc for opposing offenses due to his length and athleticism. He's a plus rebounder, and in the transition, he's an absolute menace. He hasn't quite developed abilities to create shots for his teammates, and his jumper is still a work in progress, but it's quickly approaching league average, and if he can work out the kinks in that jumper and get it up to league average or better, then with that, in combination with his athleticism, he will have a chance to be, once again, a starter-level player for a long time in the NBA. The next guy is Malik Monk. Uh, Monk is an athletic guy who can really score the ball at a high level, the only problem is that he's an absolute dumpster fire on defense. He can't guard much of anybody, and in order for him to really work out as a rotational piece in the NBA, he has to improve and at least get to a somewhat playable level on the defensive end of the floor. Otherwise, he's just going to be an end-of-the-bench guy who can get buckets in an emergency when your team is really struggling to create offense. However, I believe that he has a chance to really work out and become like an 18-point scorer if he proves that he's good enough on the defensive end of the floor to get enough time out there. He has to improve his jump shot as he only shot at 28% from the three-point line last season, but if he can get that into the 30s and even 
uh, probably the mid 30s, then I think that he could really iron out as a high level scorer off the bench. Uh, Caleb Martin, or Cody Martin, actually, I'll talk about next. Uh, he's a high level defender, does a great job guarding opposing wing players, and as we've seen in the NBA the past couple seasons, LeBron James' team won the finals last year. Kawhi Leonard's team won the finals two years ago. Kevin Durant's team won the finals three and four years ago. Then it goes back to LeBron James five years ago. You need a high-level wing player in order to win at the NBA level. The Hornets don't really have a high-level wing player at this point, but they do have a guy who can guard wings at a high level, and that is Cody Martin. He does a better job on guys like that than the average wing defender does. He's able to uh, keep them in front and does a nice job of being a team defender as well. He's both active on and off the ball, and I genuinely think that there's a chance that he could blossom and become a really, really plus defender. But on the offensive end, there's a bit more questions. In order for him to really become an elite role player, like I think he has a chance to, he's going to have to figure out how to become a, th a good three-point shooter. I think he shot it in the high 20s last year, but if he can get that into the 35 to 37 percent range in conjunction with his defensive ability, I think that he can be a really high level role player on a very good team as either a wing defender off the bench or someone who's like a fifth type starter whose job is to lock down the best offensive threat, biggest offensive threat on the opposing team. We'll talk about his brother next who is kind of the opposite of Cody Martin. I think Caleb Martin is more of a player who's going to come off the bench and hopefully be a guy who can light up the scoreboard a little bit, can score the ball at a high level, pretty good shooter, uh, can score the ball at all three levels, although he's probably best on the perimeter. He's more of a jump shooter than he is a driver. But uh, if he can figure it out on defense and get closer to average, I think he has a chance to be a decent like sixth man type who can score the ball for you and uh, be competent, at least, on defense. Finally, the last wing we'll touch on here is Jalen McDaniels. I'm also a pretty big Jalen McDaniels fan because he's a real athlete. He can uh, really compete on the defensive end of the floor, leaves it all out there. Good team defender, and he uses his athleticism and length to create uh, steals and blocks for his team that allows them to run in transition a little bit. On the offensive end is where uh, he could use some improvement. We saw him shoot the ball at a pretty high level, both in the G League and at the NBA level, and it is limited. I think he played 16 NBA games last year. He shot at 37.5% from three, and I think he was right around that same area of percentages in his time in the G League last year so I genuinely think that this guy has a chance to be a pretty solid shooter with that combined with his defense and the athleticism that if his frame fills out because he is quite skinny right now so if he adds muscle there's a chance he could become a pretty solid slasher. I think that this could be one of the bigger sleepers in the NBA and I think that there's a chance we could see him take a huge jump in the coming seasons and become a really exciting a uh, young player to watch. Finally, we move on to the big man position, which is probably the least exciting position of all for this Charlotte Hornets team. Uh, Cody Zeller is the projected starter, and I think probably should be the starter. Uh, I, I like Cody Zeller quite a bit. I don't think that he's lived up to being a top five pick like he was whatsoever. But he is a good screen setter, does a nice job of rolling to the rim and finishing at the basket. Uh, he's starting to develop a bit of a stretch game, as we saw him shoot more three-pointers last season. He's always been a pretty good free-throw shooter, shooting in the high 70s to low 80s from the strike. So I think that that's a good indicator that at some point he'll be able to shoot the three ball. It hasn't come along quite yet, as he shot in like the 24 to 26 percent range, if I'm remembering correctly, from the three-point line last year. But if he can make those improvements from three, he's going to be a really solid uh, offensive big man because he's already a good screen setter, good rim runner, good offensive rebounder. On the defensive end, it's a bit more questionable. He can't really guard on the perimeter, and he's not a real impactful guy as a rim protector. 
But because he's a good rebounder and a pretty good offensive center, I think that there's definitely a place for Cody Zeller as a bottom tier starting center uh, in the NBA. Uh, Bismack Biombo is probably going to be the backup center for the team this year. Biombo had a couple really good seasons with the Toronto Raptors earlier in his career where he dominated, or I wouldn't say dominated by any stretch, but he was a really good rim protector and rebounder, used his athleticism and size to the best of his ability to really excel in those two categories. However, because of his athleticism has declined quite a bit in the past two years, he's not quite the same impactful guy on the boards or on the defensive side of the floor as he once was. He's still a decent option as a backup big man, but I wouldn't expect a whole lot more from him. He's getting paid the minimum for a reason. He's just a bench big at this point in his career. The next guy is Vernon Carey, who was... The first of two centers that the Charlotte Hornets took with second round picks this year. I'm not a big Vernon Carey fan whatsoever. I actually like their second big man that they took in the second round, Nick Richards, quite a bit better than I like Carey. Um, Vernon Carey's like a, a dinosaur. I think I called him that before. I'll call him that again. If this would have been a 2010 NBA draft instead of 2020 I think that there's a very real chance that Vernon Carey would have gone in the top half of the lottery as a skilled big man who can score the ball at in the post at a high level but that's just not that valuable in the NBA anymore and because of his struggles defensively to guard on the perimeter and protect the rim I don't really see a place for this guy in the NBA with the possible exception of stepping into an Inez Cantor type role as a backup center and I don't understand why you would draft a player like that when you still had guys like Elijah Hughes, Robert Woodard on the board as wing players who offer some more upside than someone who, in my opinion, profiles as a long-term backup center. Finally, Nick Richards is the second of the second-round center tandem for this Hornets team. Like I said before, I like Richards better than I like Carey because I think that he's a pretty good rim protector and rebounder, which makes him already a strong defensive player. I've also heard that he's been working on his jump shot, and if he proves that he can shoot it at a decent level, then he could profile as a 3 and D stretch big, which to me is one of the more valuable player molds for a big man at this point in the NBA. Overall, I like this Charlotte Hornets team a lot, and if you've been following this YouTube channel for a while, you've probably noticed that I think this is like the fifth or sixth video I've made about this team in the past two months. I'm really intrigued by them. I think they have a lot of fun young players, and I'm definitely going to be tuning in to see them play a lot in this upcoming season. I'm very hopeful that they can be a playoff team. I definitely see them as being a competitor for like the seventh or eighth seed I think they'll probably be closer to being like somewhere in the 9 to 11 range, but even just making the play-in tournament would be a success for this team this season. They also project to have some cap space next year where they could potentially bring in one of the bigger centers in free agency, which would continue to increase this team and open up a potential window to start being a real competitor to make like the conference finals alongside uh, their young future star, hopefully, in LaMelo Ball, as well as a guy who's currently a high-level wing in Gordon Hayward. Like I said, I really, really like this team. LaMelo Ball is going to be my pick to win Rookie of the Year. When I come out with that video, Gordon Hayward will be one of my picks to make an all-star team. I think that Miles Bridges has a chance to be one of the more improved players in the NBA this season. I don't know, this might be my sneaky team this season who I'm really going to be rooting for quite a bit and watching all the time. Let, uh, in an 82 regu game regular season, I think that this team would probably win somewhere between 35 and 40 games. So in this shortened season, I'm going to predict that they win something like 30 to 34 games. So 30 and 42 worst case, 34 and 
38 best case. That sounds about right to me. Like I said before, I'm really excited to watch this Hornets team play, and I think that they're going to be a lot of fun. Let me know in the comments what you think. How many games do you think the Hornets will win this year? Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Like I said before, I've been appreciating all the support that I've been receiving lately. I think that's going to be it for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I will see you all again very soon.